presents blank and the person was supposed to fill in the city name where he or she lived. I can remember driving on trips when me and mom had to make our appearances to show the people he was a true family man that we'd see those bumper stickers stenciled in with names like Otway or Jocko Benetti in Seven Springs. Nowadays, stuff like that wouldn't fly, but back then, that was fairly sophisticated publicity. I imagine if he tried to do that now, people opposing him would insert all sorts of foul language in the blank space, but we never saw it once. Okay, maybe once. A farmer from Duplin County once wrote in the word, S-H-I-D, in the blank space, and when my mom saw it, she covered my eyes and said a prayer asking for forgiveness for the poor ignorant bastard. She didn't say the, exactly those words, but I got the gist of it. So my father, Mr. Congressman, was a big wig, and everyone but everyone knew it, including old man Egbert. Now, the two of them didn't get along, not at all, despite the fact that my father went to Egbert's church whenever he was in town which, to be frank, wasn't all that often. Egbert, in addition to his belief that fornicators were destined to clean the urinals in hell, also believed that communism was a sickness that doomed mankind to heathenhood. Even though heathenhood wasn't a word, I can't find it in any dictionary, the congregation knew what he meant. They also knew that he was directing his words specifically to my father, who would sit with his eyes closed and pretend not to listen. <laughs> My father was on the house committees that oversaw the Red Influence, supposedly infiltrating every aspect of the country, including national defense, higher education, and even tobacco farming. You have to remember that this was during the Cold War. Tensions were running high, and we North Carolinians needed something to bring it down to a more personal level. My father had consistently looked for facts which were irrelevant to people like Edward. Afterward, when my father would come home after the service, he'd say something like, Reverend Sullivan was in rare form today. I hope you heard that part about the scripture where Jesus was talking about the poor. Yeah, sure, Dad. My father tried to defuse situations whenever possible. I think that's why he stayed in Congress for so long. The ugliest babies known to mankind and still come up with something nice to say. He's such a gentle child, he'd say when a baby had a giant hat. Or, I'll bet she's the sweetest girl in the world if she had a birthmark over her entire face. One time a lady showed up with a kid in a wheelchair. My father took one look at him and said, I bet you didn't want that you're the smartest kid in your class. And he was. Yeah, my father was great at stuff like that. He could fling it with the best of them, that's for sure. And he wasn't such a bad guy, not really. Especially if you consider the fact that he didn't beat me or anything. But he wasn't there for me growing up. I hate to say that because nowadays people claim that sort of stuff even if their parent was around and use it to excuse their behavior. My dad, he didn't love me. That's why I became a stripper and performed on the Jared Springer show. I'm not using it to excuse the person I've become. I'm simply saying it as a fact. My father was gone nine months of the year, living out of town in a Washington, D.C. apartment 300 miles away. My mother didn't go with him because both of them wanted me to grow up the same way they had. Of course, my father's father took him hunting and fishing, taught him to play ball, showed up at birthday parties and all that stuff that adds up to quite a bit before adulthood. My father, on the other hand, was a stranger, someone I barely knew at all. For the first five years of my life, I thought all fathers lived to somewhere else. It wasn't until my best friend Eric Hunter asked me in kindergarten who that guy was who showed up at my house the night before I realized something wasn't 
quite right about the situation. He's my father, I said proudly. Oh, Eric said as he rifled through my lunchbox looking for my Milky Way. I didn't know you had a father. Talk about something whacking you straight in the face. So I grew up under the care of my mother. Now she was a nice lady, sweet and gentle, the kind of mother most people dream about. But she wasn't, nor could she ever be, a manly influence in my life. And that fact, coupled with my grown disillusionment with my father, made me become something of a rebel, even at a young age. Not a bad one, mind you. Me and my friends might sneak out late and soap up car windows now and then, or eat boiled peanuts in the graveyard behind the church. But in the fifties, that was the kind of thing that made other parents shake their heads and whisper to their children. You don't want to be like that car to boy. He's on the fast track to prison. Me, a bad boy, for eating boiled peanuts in the graveyard. Go figure. Anyway, my father and Hebert didn't get along, but it wasn't only because of politics. No. It seems that my father and Egbert knew each other from way back when. Egbert was about 20 years older than my father and back before he was a minister. He used to work for my father's father. My grandfather. Even though he spent lots of time with my father, was a true bastard if there ever was one. He was one. He was the one, by the way, who made the family fortune. You to imagine him as a sort of man who slaved over his business, working diligently and watching it grow, prospering slowly over time. My grandfather was much shrewder than that. The way he made his money was simple. He started as a bootlegger, accumulating wealth throughout the prohibition by running rum up from Cuba. Then he began buying land and hiring sharecroppers to work it. He took 90% of the money the sharecroppers made on their tobacco crop, then loaned them the money wherever they needed it at ridiculous interest rates. Of course, he never intended to collect the money. Instead, he would foreclose on any land or equipment they happened to own. Then, in what he called his own moment of inspiration, he started a bank called Carter Banking and Loan. The only other bank in a two-county radius had mysteriously burned down. Instead of the depression, it never reopened. Though everyone knew what had really happened, not a word was ever spoken for fear of retribution, and their fear was well placed. The bank wasn't the only building that had mysteriously burned down. His interest rates were outrageous, and little by little he began amassing more land and property as people. Thank you. 
so many people got emotional whenever they saw the Christmas play. They knew it was based on something that happened in real life, which gave it special meaning. Jamie Sullivan was a senior in high school just like me, and she had already been chosen to play the angel. Not that anyone else even had a chance. This, of course, made the play extra special that year. It was going to be a big deal, maybe the biggest ever, at least in Miss Garper's mind. She was the drama teacher, and she was already glowing about the possibilities the first time I met her in class. Now, I hadn't really planned on taking drama that year. I really hadn't, but it was either that or chemistry too. The thing was, I thought it would be a blow-off class, especially when compared with my other options. No tests, no tables where I'd have to memorize protons and neutrons and combine elements in their proper formulas. What could possibly be better for a high school senior? It seemed like a sure thing, and when I signed up for it, I thought I'd just be able to sleep through, through most every class, which, considering my late night peanut eating, was fairly important at the time. On the first day, I was one of the last to arrive, coming in just a few seconds before the bell rang, and I took a seat in the back of the room. Miss Garber had her back turned to the class, and she was busy writing her name in big cursive letters, as if we didn't know who she was. Everyone knew her. It was impossible not to. She was big, at least six feet two, with flaming red hair and pale skin that showed her freckles also overweight. I'd say, honestly, she pushed to 50, and she had a fondness for wearing flower-patterned moo-moos. She had thick, dark, horned-rimmed glasses, and she greeted everyone with, hello, sort of singing the last syllable. Finally joined in because it was obvious that she wanted us. 